Ni hao, kia ora dear colleagues from ECNU. Um, how wonderful to be together, at least like this. I'm really sorry that I cannot join you in person or via um, live via via Zoom technology or Wolf technology. However, unfortunately, um, it's already a summer holidays here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and uh, I'm with my family on a family vacation. It's my great pleasure and privilege to be invited to be part of this speaker series and to deliver a talk that I titled Philosophy of Education in a New Key, the Future of Childhood Education. My name is Professor Marek Tessar, and I'm also, so on a, and I'm and I'm working very closely with colleagues in ECNU, supporting students and working with a journal. But at the same time, I'm I'm a professor at the Faculty of Education and Social Work at the University of Auckland, which is one of the key and main institution at the, um, in um, in Australasia and in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm, um, I'm a president um, of the Philosophy of Education Society of Australasia that proudly publishes journal Education of Philosophy and Theory. Um, um, I'm also uh, editor-in-chief of Policy Futures in Education. I'm head of school of um, one of the largest schools um, in uh, Faculty of Education, and I'm also associate dean for international affairs. And to add to it, I'm also director of Center for Global Childhoods. And all these together sort of links to my interest in the philosophy of education, as well as in the childhood and early years, because we know that the future of childhood is really the future of all of us. Uh, if you wanna keep in touch with me, I have posted my um, my WeChat there, so you can scan and, uh, and connect with me if you have any questions or if you have any kind of uh, um, further want to continue conversations, I would be delighted to keep in touch with you. And thanks again to everybody at ECNU for, for your support and for your very kind and generous um, invitation to give this talk. I will just start my, my talk with the idea of, uh, of reading. So um, over the past two, three years, we published particularly number of different papers that I think are quite interesting. And uh, and if you would like to um, read some of them, do let me know, because they do sort of contribute or talk about the ideas around um, philosophy of education, childhood education, the future, and so on. So the first one is towards a post-COVID-19 new normality, physical and social distancing and move to online and higher education, which is published by uh, really, um, really good journal published by SAGE, Policy Futures in Education, that, um, and, and that paper is extremely, is extremely powerful. It's a paper, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a paper that sort of really charts the new future for what the education may potentially look like. Link, that paper is freely available online, so it's an open access. The second is a book, uh, Theorizing Positive and Childhood Studies, that's available as an e-copy as well as hard copy, which sort of really looks at the idea of childhood from philosophical perspective and really sort of traces the history and the ontology of childhood as we sort of go all the way from the very beginning and from the philosophy to the current concerns. And we sort of chart a territory around sociology of childhood and uh and the post-structural notions of childhood, all the way to the current post-anthropocentric childhoods, or if you like, the ideas around the uh, climate change, or the ideas around what are the con con um, contemporary concerns around childhood. So, so, so this is something that's that's actually really, really important, and that we consider to be uh, really, really powerful because that's actually. Uh, um, is something that um, um, that 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 book. Oops, apologies. That book provides a knowledge that is really important uh, because on three hundred pages or so, it really traces in nine chapters the whole history of childhood, all the way towards post-human understanding of childhoods. The third reading that I highly recommend to accompany this lecture is. Uh, Philosophy of Education in a New Key, Future of Philosophy of Education. That's a collective writing piece published by about 25 um, 
philosophers of education that have very clearly highlighted and charted the territory, but stating what is philosophy of education, um, what its future, what are its current condition, and where we sort of heading. And it's a fascinating read, and I highly recommend it. It's published in the Education of Philosophy and Theory, which is, as I said, the flagship journal of the PISA, Philosophy of Education Society, Australasia, that, by the way, um, I just literally returned yesterday from where we celebrated our 50th anniversary as a society. And uh, we we're very proudly remembering our colleagues in China who are very often contributing to EPED journal. And the fourth paper is the philosophy as a method, tracing the histories and intersections between philosophy, methodology, and education, which is, again, conceptual methodological paper published by um, Journal Qualitative Inquiry, which is very high which is very highly regarded um, qualitative journal. So these are some of the readings that we would like you to consider. And um, as we sort of move on, we move on towards a future of philosophy of education, where we sort of asking the questions, what is the future? What matters? What is important? What complex societal and political relations are privileged? Which one should we have leave behind? And this is some really important conversations because these questions, while they may sound trivial on the surface, what they actually do, they really are putting our our sort of um, our interest. They they're putting the um, so to speak the finger on the pulse of what actually is currently happening. So we don't need to understand that uh, there are complex society and political relations that are privileged. And the question is, which ones are those? And uh, particularly, which one we should we leave behind? And and the, and the question is, like, where is indigenous philosophy in all of this? Um, where is the philosophy? What's the relationship between philosophy over, uh, and methodology? And and one could argue that philosophy goes over methodology, or or are we reading? Is it reading over writing? Should we have more? Should we do more reading before we write? Because at the moment, there is a quite a lot of uh, pressure on everybody to write, but there is not so much pressure on everybody to read. And one could argue that COVID-19 was actually an accelerator, equalizer, or making differences more visible and stronger. What was it? So we know that COVID-19 has accelerated processes, and we have all jumped on online. And, and I know the colleagues in China has been amazing on WeChat already, but now we really mastered the idea of sort of de delivering some, some courses, some programs online. And the, But was it also an equalizer? Did it, help, um, did it help participation in classes? Did it actually allow people to come together more rather than to stay separate? Or did it make actually differences between diverse groups that were disadvantaged originally, even more visible and more stronger? And these are some of the key questions that I'm sort of asking in this paper. And um, it's really important to understand that this is talking about future of philosophy um, of education. Um, and uh, and that is something really uh, very powerful. So. Let's actually look at what philosophy. Let's actually look at what philosophy of education actually is, what philosophy of childhood actually is. So Matthews, nineteen ninety four, argues that the philosophy of childhood is perhaps to understand the philosophy itself, and he claims, and there's a quote, any development of theory that rules out on purely theoretical grounds even the possibility that we adults may occasionally have something to learn morally from a child is, for that reason, defective. It's also morally offensive. And that's a very powerful quote, because what it actually does, that quote, it highlights that there are developmental theories that actually, with the way they play out, they can, just purely on the basis of theory, really rule out any kind of ideas, any kind of possibilities that adults can have a productive relationship with children. In other words, that adults can be learning from children. And he finds that morally of morally wrong, offensive, and defective uh, cognitively. And that's really interesting argument. And I would like to sort of stop here for a second because understanding and interrogating the very idea of childhood 
from this kind of philosophical perspective really relies on us to have a really historical and philosophical knowledge that grounds theories of education and really also practice of, of, um, of pedagogy. And that's something really, really important. So what's the story of a child in all of this? Because we talk about the childhood as a sort of event, and there is a child as a biological being. So what is that? The story of philosophy and education is pedagogical. It's focused on the treatment of the child as a problem to shape, to change, to mold, to educate, and these kind of different perspectives regarding whether the ideal was to maintain the status quo or to create a better educational future for all. And that's an excellent sort of statement because it really speaks to the idea that what the story of philosophy and education is and uh, and how it is to shape, to change, to mold, to educate, you know, these different perspectives, you know, this kind of idea that there's an ideal child towards which we're looking up and towards which, towards which we are molding particular subject. The other thing is conventions on the rights of a child or UNCROG as we call it. This is something extremely powerful and extremely important document because it is actually some of the strongest and most significant statements about children and childhoods are presented in this United Nations approved Convention on the Rights of the Child that every, every country in the world has agreed upon and has ratified. And this document in many ways defines the very idea of the philosophy of childhood because suddenly we do have a document that really speaks to the idea of childhood. And that is the idea of a child. So we have an article one of the declaration that clearly defines that the child and his, her relationships with childhoods as a young person under the age of 18. So we can see the child is defined as a person under the age of 18 that has particular rights. They are related to his or her wishes, to the episteem, and they are regardless of gender and abilities and ethnicities and race, they are all considered. So Article 1 really articulates the central idea relevant to both the philosophical and the policy framework. And it's extremely powerful. I mean, UNCROG is really now celebrated over 30 years of existence, but it's been one of the most fundamental and foundational documents which we are still using in order to understand what are the contours of child, who is a child. It also helps us to understand what are the rights of the child, and while if you say, well, get a five, seven-year-old to read this and what do they make of it? Well, guess what? There is actually a children's version of the UNCROG. So you can have a child-friendly version through which you can really explain and let children to really engage and to experience and to really work with this kind of document. But let's focus for a second on the history of childhood because I think that, <coughs> excuse me, the way it sort of works is that we have a number of historians of childhood that sort of try to pinpoint and trace the history of the childhood. So sort of very Foucauldian notion of genealogy that sort of apply. And Hugh Cunningham in 2006 really argues the childhoods are invented and they are not universal across time, cultures and society. So what does he actually mean by that? That's a, quite a strong statement that childhoods are invented and they are not universal. So does it mean that one childhood is not like the other? Well, let's see what he claims. We don't all agree on when childhood begins, at conception, at birth, at some point beyond babyhood. And we certainly don't agree on when it ends, at puberty, when we leave school, when we leave home, when we cease to be financially dependent on our parents, when we are of an age to be criminally responsible or to have sex, serve in the armed forces, buy alcoholic drinks or drive a car an excellent quote because what it points out to the how everybody considers a different age when childhood begins and childhood ends at the end what we usually use is the law so we use the kind of policy to determine when the child ends so it's over somewhere it may be 18 somewhere it may be 21 somewhere it may be 16 because that's the sort of policy requirement for example for the person to be able to drink alcohol to to get married to have legally sex, to um, to be um, to be to leave home and not stop being financially dependent on the parents, and so on and so forth. Drive the car. <clears throat> so these are very powerful, really important statements. 
And the history of childhood is really important because it really helps us to understand how did we get here. And if we further start to examine the history of childhood, we sort of get to the idea of Arius, who was this French philosopher and historian of childhood, who claimed that in medieval society, there was no apparent child-centered approach and children were deemed in need of protection by the family. And the structure of the family unit was very limited and children left home at a very young age, and they were seen as a little adults. So what, what this basically means is that at the time, there was no economy associated with children and their development. There was no line between the child and adult and what it was. It was extremely permeable. So what does it mean is that there were no services, or there were no agencies, there were no pediatricians to support children. They were just doctors to support children compared to modernity where suddenly a growing number of products and provisions provided to and for children were suddenly provided. There was no toy store. There was now toys, clothing, children's clothing store. It was all part, it was just the smaller sizes of an adult's books. There were no children's literature that would be published. So what it all means is that at certain point, there was an invention of a childhood that sort of happened and that sort of continued. So. It's the um, the idea of public, of free and compulsory, you know, schooling, cemented the very idea that we understand the children and the childhoods, and uh, and the way we are considered in contemporary times. You know, those children' toys, the children's clothing, the children's stories, they were non-existent at the time, as I said before. And Arius argues to sort of prove that point that that's not really the case. That in medieval society. The idea of childhood really did not exist. And medieval art until the 12th century did not know, did not attempt to portray it even. So that's absolutely fascinating because we actually do not have any arts records of, of that. So let's look at the, sort of further look at the philosophy of child and the story of the evil rational and the free child. And um, just to prove my points, look at this painting. Look at this painting. And you can see these children dressed in those adults' clothing, that's just a little bit of a smaller size. I mean, that's just absolutely fascinating. So that there was no children's clothing, there were no dinosaurs, there were no, uh, there were no Disney characters or someone else sort of coming in. So medieval child, medieval society made no distinction between children and adults in dress or work or in play. And that's really important because I can demonstrate to you the dress based upon the painting. But what's more, there is this whole area of work or in play. And that's something that needs to be properly, really properly examined. Then we have a Puritan discourse that's really important. So it's coming from Christianity and children are potentially sort of born as evil, as wicked. That was the dominant idea and um, sort of Adam and Eve sort of like all humans were born sinful, so there is an original sin that they carry. And for example, then you have a persistent crying of a child and you sort of try to say, oh my God, I mean, there's a failure to thrive. You know, there's a manifestation of devil and, and Lloyd the Mouse, another historian of childhood, actually claimed that baptism was used to include actual exorcism of the devil because of that persistent crying. So one of the key sort of thinkers of this area is Tom Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes. Um, and he sees child is a savage beast. And Thomas Hobbes, just like the Puritans, is very known for his belief that children, you know, or, or people in general, let's say, were innately evil. He actually believed that children were born so unruly and anarchistic, and it was the parents' responsibility to constrain these traits and discipline, to tame them. So what he claims is that we require social contracts and organized societal authority to tame, or at least to keep in check the savage beast within us all. I mean, what a fantastic metaphor. So often we refer to children as devilish or monster or little beasts with little understanding of how we are reiterating the very same sentimental espoused by Hobbes back in 16th century. What a powerful quote again. That's a really, really good one. So let's look at uh, John Locke, who is the next philosopher that we will consider here. And what he sort of looked at the child is uh, he claimed the child is an empty slate, or in other words, child is a 
tabula rasa, uh, blank slide, empty slide. And that's really important concept. Um, he, John Locke, we should all know about him because uh, John Locke was, uh, was an English philosopher. He was widely known as the father of classical neoliberalism. Uh, Locke's theory of mind is a classic text often cited that uh, as a as a sort of uh, concept of uh, origin of modern conceptions of identity and of self. And uh, generally, the proponents of the tabula rasa thesis really favored the nurture side of the nature versus nurture debate. And uh, so when it comes to aspects of one's personality, social and emotional behavior and intelligence really come into play. So John Logue argues that ignorant, shameless, undisciplined and child represents the failure of the adults, not of the child. So we can see the blame the blame the adults, not the child discourse. What a difference to Hobbes. And just like Sigmund Freud's ideas about physical repression 200, 100 years later, Locke's tabula rasa created a sense of guilt in parents about their children's development. It provides the philosophical and epistemological grounds for making a careful nurturing of children a really a national priority. So John Locke postulated the notion of tabula rasa and refers to this epistemological thesis that individuals are born without this kind of building mental content that we now have as an adult or as a children, and that, excuse me, all the children's knowledge and um, all the, all, all the other thing what child knows comes from the experience, comes through the senses, comes through the perception. And that's absolutely powerful quote. So the mind is shaped by experience, by sensations and reflections. And that means is that you have these kind of being the two sources of all our ideas. So that's really, really good. Um, so, uh, and then we continue to the, to the romantic age. And can I just for a second, I mean, dear colleagues, look at these two paintings. Look at that idealized romantic childhood. And now you can see this kind of dreamy child being positioned on that painting. This is the romantic age of a late 18th, 19th century. You've got the Joshua Reynolds painting. You have the age of innocence. You have the portrait of child as children of romantic age. I mean, so the beautiful paintings that absolutely romanticize the children. What a difference to Hobbes and what a difference to Locke when we're looking. And what did he say, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was the main protagonists of this era. He claims that children were inherently good. He was fine with that, but become corrupted by the evils of society. We are born good, and this is our natural state, he states. So it was possible to preserve the original perfect nature of the child by means of the careful control of his educational environment based on analysis of the different physical and psychological stages through which he passed from birth to maturity. <laughs> so, Jean Jacques Rousseau seen child as pure nature and innocence. And Rousseau's intellectual ears Friedrich, uh, was Friedrich Froebel, Maya Montessori, Jean Piaget, and a lot of others. But you can see that idea of an education and environment, perfection by the nature, and so on. So, this is all really, really important because this all sort of um, creates, uh, this all creates quite an um, important notion, what that philosophy of edu childhood, education, what kind of questions are we actually asking here? And some of these questions are pretty good because they sort of point out that what's the criterion for the constitution of knowledge? And that's a really important question to ask. I mean, how do we, how is knowledge actually produced? And similarly to second one, who decides which knowledge is actually important, which knowledge matters? And who should have access to that knowledge? Is there a knowledge that sort of shouldn't be um, shouldn't be presented to people? So how should knowledge be judged, changed, or modified? Should, should all children have access to all knowledge, or should there be limits placed on who can be exposed to certain knowledge? And on when this exposure should take place? So you can see these kind of questions that are being consistently raised around the idea of children, of knowledge, 
of the idea of philosophy of childhood? These are really important questions, and I really hope that we will be sort of a little bit addressing them throughout. So, so the cartographies of materials and thinking with childhood theories is really important because if we move to the current state and we talk about a future, is that children are really experiencing their childhood in the Anthropocene. Anthropocene is a human-made era. So um, it's an it's similar as an ice age, but what happened is ice age happened just purely by nature, but Anthropocene is actually a result of the, our, our, our pollution of, um, of environment and, uh, and particularly it's a rapid climate change as we're changing what's happening and what's sort of going on. So, uh, so that's something um, that requires our really uh, real... Uh, um re real um real attention so so what what what's so the anthropocene as a sort of era that we all sort of bought into is that not everybody is equal in this era because the children are not as equal as adults they don't have so much say yet they are going to be the ones who's going to be inheriting this planet from us adults so we do need to care about what kind of future and future of childhood we are actually leaving for our younger citizens. What are we leaving for our children? So we need really new thinking and new theories in this era. We can't rely on the old ones. We are not all in Anthropocene together. The poor and the dispossessed and the children are far more in it than all the others. That's absolutely the truth. And that came very quite clearly through the conference that we had uh, last week, actually. We are not... We are not uh, we are not all in the Anthropocene. Um, so new ways of thinking with theory can really help to disrupt the child constructs because all these constructs that we created about children, they are in order to deal with the complexities of children's lives. And that can actually really, uh, really help us. So um, that's really, really useful to think that we may have a new theories that may help us to answer things. And what are some of these constructs? So let's just quickly go through constructs. I'm aware of a time, so I want to go quite quickly through them. Construct number one, child is a hybrid assemblage. So what that means is that the, it's a construct to disrupt and trouble the traditional biological and psychological thinking of child subjects. It's sort of like a counter narrative to the biological reductionalisms of childhood and body. And it's a rupture their strong biological and realist relationships. So childhood can also be considered as part of a larger assemblage, the human and non-human condition. And it's kind of discursive and material that produce that kind of hybrid child. And, um, and the idea of becoming is really important. So look at that face of a child, the, the painting of a child's face caused the particular material touching the face cause a discursive becoming of a child, becoming an animal child assemblage, means a new body structure and capacity to film is produced. And this child was very shy and suddenly there was a mask of a tiger and he would go, Rah! he would get all action. He would gain the subjectivity just based upon the paint on his, on his face. So these picture books and children's literature can of course portray the longing, the desire for being a human subject in some stories which is often reversed by the stories of children wanting to become like non-human subjects. So the becoming is a process of fluid change. In childhood, it may be stories of assemblages, of pains and pedagogies, performed on the surface of the child's and the teacher's face, through face painting activities, reimagining the assemblage and the idea of becoming. So we do push boundaries of the child construct beyond that simplistic representations of childhoods. An event of childhoods become, becomes really productive and pedagogical in an unexpected way. And then really sort of disturbs and resists the normative, traditional developmental representations of childhood. So it's very important. The idea of becoming is extremely, extremely powerful. Construct number two, child as a body. The story of a Jane from the Westfield Mall. I love telling this story because I think it's absolutely fascinating. So in the big mall, um, they found in the bathrooms, uh, in the female bathroom, they, they found a girl um, who, was, um, who was naked and um, unconscious. And so they called the ambulance and they woke her up and, uh, and, and, and the girl has amnesia. She couldn't remember anything, not her name, not her age. And 
and the doctors examined her body and, and they just could say that, well, this young lady is somewhere between the age between 11 and 19. And me thinking, oh my God, I mean, what are we going to do with such an information? I mean, between 11 and 19, how do we make sure that the child, how do we assign the age? Because because the Jane, as they called her, she couldn't remember anything. But how do you assign the age? Because if you assign someone 18, we talked about it before, that means particular responsibilities and allowances. If you get the 11, you send the child back to compulsory schooling. So there's been a massive issue. But what it also means is that we use actually body and child's body separately as a kind of discursive. So there's a difference between the childhood and the notion of a child and biological age. It's just a policy that's assigned to an age. So we could decide what we want to do with the age. So the biolog biologizing approach to childhoods really works to classify, to segregate, to place, to divide, and to distribute childhoods into sections, schooling, institutions, and leagues. And the absence of certainty about the biological age of a body leads to the uncertainty in decision-making about what should happen with the child, how the child should be educated, and how the child should grow up. So by giving up that knowledge of a child's age, we lose that ideal, the image of the child, an innocent child in particular. So the control over the child and the decision-making on for with the child becomes a much more complex issue So, and process. So that's really important. So so, the, so it's it's really important to understand that this is something that, uh, um, that really makes a great deal a difference in childhood studies this kind of idea of a of a child's body let's look at the third construct and that's a child is other and more than human subjects so those of you who've been to hong kong or to melbourne you would know that the dog receives an education and care just like a human child you know dogs are they're protected they're babied they are even pushed through the park in a pram and only the careful look inside the pram reveals that this expected child and child body is actually a dog. Oh my God, it's a puppy. And we thought it was all a child all the time along. So the local citizens behave towards, towards a dog child as they would to an infant child subject in the pram. They lean over to the pram and they admire the more than human subject. And if you don't believe me how it looks, here it goes. Here is a little schnauzer in the pram. So the question that Mindy Blaise, for example, is asking is what colonizing or cultural practices places little dogs into a pram in Hong Kong? You know, the kind of imagining baby dog exercise becomes the kind of concern of the ethics and politics of a of child subject and not human and animal subject species encounters. So the prams were originally pulled by animals such as goats or dogs or ponies. And then Blaise wonders, so who is pushing the pram at this moment in Hong Kong? Because her to reflect and notice the non-human animals no longer pull the carriage. Instead, I see human animals pushing human and canine animals. So that's really powerful. So in Hong Kong, these particular human animals are more likely to be foreign domestic workers, obviously, rather than the actual pet owners and parents. And, and you get to see this colonial approach all over again. But let's come back to the multiplicities of child constructs. So philosophy of childhood gives us really freedom to think differently and across disciplines around childhood's bodies and education. You know, philosophy of childhood really enables us to argue that children understand and perform their bodies in ways often different from adults. So the idea of becoming the good, the ideal child, the fairy tale, the innocent, the cute outcomes is the real embodiment of educational and societal regulatory spaces that govern children's bodies. New materialism, post-humanism, and the modern human assemblages and constructs as an alternative may really shift and shape the ideal child and disrupt the reproduction of ideal childhoods, offering a resistance to the expected public child subjects in childhoods. So the animal child construct allows the materiality and discursiveness of children and childhoods to come really forward and move beyond these constructions and representations of the singular, single and child construct. So what is that kind of philosophy of education in New Key, the future of childhood education? So philosophy of childhood in contemporary anthropocentric times really means conceptualizing children and their childhoods within both the exciting and the worrying times that we face. 
it perceives children as having an impact on and shaping the present alongside other humans and non-human entities. There are close relationships and interdependencies with whom children share the place, times, methods, meanings, equally able to affect or have agency in, in their contemporary worlds. There's a cause for new forms of ontologies and epistemologies. And at the same time, there's a generation COVID or C19, as I'm writing in another text. And with that, I would like to say, thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate having um, this opportunity to present my talk and uh, I wish you all the best for the seminar. I wish I was there in person, hopefully next year. All the best and fingers crossed that everything goes well with, with all the COVID restrictions and that you will have a very productive day and uh, enjoy your time together. Ni hao, one more time. Thank you so much. Stay in touch. All the best. Bye.